Eric Tova Fula, good morning, Austin. Dobre vecher in Kiev. My name is Wayne Firestone. I'm the host for American Israel Friendship League. And we are bringing you live a program as advertised from the front lines in Ukraine. What we didn't advertise at the time and certainly didn't know is that uh, at the moment we would go live that an air siren would go off at the very location where we're uh, hopefully going to be bringing you back our, our panel of experts from Israel who as volunteers and as part of a national mission are in Israel. Literally 10 minutes ago, as we prepared to uh, uh, our, our, our countdown slide, which some of you are, are used to at the beginning of your show, uh, we began to hear uh, air raid sirens going off at this uh, location. It's literally a tent where our colleagues are operating an entire field hospital from. We are uh, uh, hopeful uh, uh, that we will be able to uh, have them back with us live in a few moments. Uh, you know something, just hearing those air raid sirens as uh, I have to admit that the last time I've heard air raid sirens was when I was in Israel and uh, it's a scary thing. And so I just want to ask everyone in the audience uh, today, we have people in Maine and Canada and Illinois in Pennsylvania, uh, West Palm Beach, Ottawa, Canada, uh, people from literally all over, uh, my neighbors in Pikesville, Maryland. Uh, today, we need your prayers as well as your attention. And so uh, I'll borrow a page from, uh, remember the early days when you could send a prayer uh, via email or, or, or uh, uh, someone to insert something in the Kotel. Uh, let's do that as well. Let's use our chat now. If you have a, a, a prayer uh, for peace and safety, a message that you want to deliver directly to Ukraine, to the Ukrainian people, and to our Israeli colleagues who now themselves are in harm's way in their work to make this humanitarian crisis somewhat more uh, manageable. We appreciate hearing from you. I'm seeing people from South Africa, from North Carolina, Upper Manhattan, Boston, Johannesburg, South Africa. I see emojis of people praying. Goodwill and virtual community are what has helped get many of us through this very, very difficult period. And here we are again, even in this context where Israelis are, are trying to help out others in harm's way. Um, I'm grateful to have a full team uh, here at America Israel Friendship League, which brings you these programs each week. We've done over 200 episodes and really the brainchild of this project is my colleague, Jonathan Barsadeh. He himself just got back from a trip uh, uh, from Israel just a few days ago. And uh, we're sort of like the US mail service. I think that it doesn't matter whether it's raining or shining and uh, snowing or, or we're, we're always on. And uh, we know that this story of the bond between American and Israel friendship continues. And it has continued to show its versatility and strength, even during this uh, uh, this new crisis that that the world is confronting in Ukraine. So, Jonathan, let me turn over to you first, just for a few thoughts, and then to introduce uh, a guest speaker that we had lined up uh, as part of the official delegation, and uh, the hopes that over the course of the hour, anyway, we'll be able to resume our our panel uh, panelists uh, will be able to return to uh, the webinar screen as well. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks. Thank. I mean, I, I must admit, it's literally uh, the timing was so was so weird. I mean, as we were literally as we were going live with the slide four minutes before, you started hearing the air and sirens over there, and it took me a second to realize actually what's happening because you know, living, growing up, living uh, much of my life in Israel. Uh, air raid sirens is something you know that is part part of your life. Going back to the Yom Kippur War, going uh, you know through the different wars, going through the intifadas, and you know you hear the air raid sirens, and it's either it's on uh, Yom Atzmaut where you stand still uh, in memory and commemoration, or you make a wild dash to the to the nearest shelter because uh, of incoming, and all of a sudden you realize this is happening in not not in Israel, but actually it's happening in Europe. 
Um, it's happening in modern day Europe and things that you wouldn't have expected. You thought that 1945, the end of World War II, uh, that's it. It stopped and the craziness is still continuing. And it's just, it gives you a sense of surrealism of this, we're living here in a crazy, crazy time period. And, you know, Bottom line is that, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, before this webinar and it's sort of get a, a very dual type of sense over here on the one side, and I've got a lot of pride, but also a lot of sadness in, in, me, in seeing this in bringing this greeting uh, uh, for the panel and this webinar. And I'll start with the latter, with the sadness, because sadness, it's because of the circumstances uh, that give rise to the subject matter, war, casualty, death, destruction, and, you know, pride, because once again, the state of Israel is rising to the occasion to help, you know, those in need, you know, in the forefront. You know, it's really hard to believe, you know, that we're already over two months into this war that's defying all expectations. And, you know, a war that actually, until the date started, everyone believed that it won't even take place. Nobody believed it's going to happen. And he, a war that once it did start, everybody believed that it'll be over within a few short days with no destruction, little casualties, if any, that the Russians will just, uh, Russian army will just steamroll over uh, Ukraine. And, you know, a war that um, where a TV comedian is leading his people in doing the unthinkable, where his one line impromptu zinger at the beginning of, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition, that kind of zinger is going to reverberate for generations. Uh, a wall we are once again rooting ourselves, rooting everyone for the good guys, and praying that once again, uh, you know, David will somehow uh, overcome Goliath. But there's one thing that is similar in this war to really all other wars, and that's the terrible price that's being paid each and every day and every hour in the streets of Kyrgyzstan, Kiev, Mariupol, and I can go on and on with names that will go down in history a price that actually is being play, paid by the displaced, the injured, the casualties and their families. That actually, you know, the people. There are many debates whether, what, and how others can help with the war effort, but there is no place for debate about uh, supporting the people that we need. And once again, Israel as a nation, its government is rising to the occasion to help these people. Since soon after its establishment, we always come back to the fact that Israel as a country has been a symbol of not only its ability to defend itself, but also in showing compassion gener and generosity towards those in need. And it oftentimes does so without recognition because simply because it's the right thing to do. In addition to the aid that it's been sending these last few months, Israel was the first, if not still the only, I'm not sure about that, country to actually send a fully functional field hospital to help tend to those civilians who their simple crime was to be in the line of fire. And we'll hear today, well, we hope to hear actually about these efforts to do what that most basic of human compassion, saving lives. And when you hear the story, you cannot but feel pride that in this crazy world, there is some good that is still taking place. And with that, I'd like to transfer the screen over to my colleague, Asaf Segev, who is the director in the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the old Israeli consulates in North America. Asaf. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a good opportunity um, uh, to mention the excellent cooperation between the American Israel Friendship League and the Foreign Ministry of the State of Israel. Uh, this collaboration goes for many, many years, and we highly appreciate it. Um, regarding the Israeli activity in the context of Ukraine, I would like to say, uh, maybe to underline a few points to put um, um, the work of the field hospital uh, maybe in a, in a broader picture of, uh, of the Israeli efforts in Ukraine. Uh, the field hospital, by the way, called Kochav Meir, which in Hebrew means shining star. Uh, we will hear from them hopefully shortly. They're doing an amazing job and they make us all very, very proud. And um, as you mentioned, Jonathan, they left Israel to Ukraine. Israel is um, a country that knows 
uh, from time to time to cope, unfortunately, with security challenges. And they're going to hear sirens and, and to risk them life now uh, in a different country for uh, the people in, in order to support the people of Ukraine. Uh, but we will hear from them uh, shortly. Um, when the crisis in Ukraine started over two months ago, um, I would say that the first priority of the Israeli foreign ministry was first and foremost to uh, assist Israelis that uh, are in Ukraine, whether it's for work or they live there or for study, uh, to return to Israel if they choose to do so. So what we did is we sent them before the war actually started, uh, we send them uh, messages uh, in every channel possible to convince them to return to Israel. Because we, as many people around the world, we saw where um, this crisis goes. And we wanted to make sure that our citizens and civilians are safe. Um, half of them, there were a few thousands uh, of Israelis and families uh, over there uh, before, uh, just before the war started, about half of them uh, left Ukraine because of our um, uh, messages, strong messages to convince them to return to Israel. Half of them stayed when the war uh, started. Um, and then it was much more complicated, of course, um, but we assist them uh, to cross the borders uh, from Ukraine um, uh, eventually to arrive to Israel. And we send our diplomats um, uh, to meet Israelis in the crossing points, in the borders between Ukraine and the surrounding countries in order to assure that they are uh, be able to leave Ukraine safely. Uh, today, the vast majority of Israelis uh, already left uh, Ukraine and they are in Israel. Um, during this process, we, there were also uh, some very sensitive um, issues with families that were in Ukraine for uh, uh, the sur um, surrogacy process in order to bring children. And um, we also assisted them, we assisted uh, to grandchildren of righteous among the nations that wanted to leave Ukraine and to come to Israel. Uh, we also assist um, um, the Jewish community, Jewish people who wanted to leave Ukraine. Um, we assist them as much as possible to arrive, to leave Ukraine and to arrive to Israel. And we also assist um, Jewish communities in other countries in, in this region that wanted to arrive to Israel. Uh, this is regarding Israelis and uh, assisting Israelis and Jewish people in Ukraine. But in the diplomatic arena, um, we were very, very clear about where we stand, supporting Ukraine uh, together with our uh, allies, the United States of America and other like-minded countries. Um, uh, it, and it was expressed very clearly in the UN uh, uh, and other international uh, organization when we voted uh, together um, with the international community to support Ukraine. Um, our uh, Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Bennett was uh, active in order uh, to assist uh, the ongoing uh, negotiations uh, in order to bring peace. And of course, um, Israel uh, and as you as I can see now, our uh, team in the field hospital uh, came back. Um, uh, our um, uh, humanitarian assistant of the foreign ministry, of especially of Mashav, the Agency for International Development Cooperation of the of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, we send uh, a lot of support to the Ukrainian people. For example, we send over one hundred tons of humanitarian medical equipment, which was required by the officials in Ukraine. We send six mega generators, huge, huge generators for hospitals and civilian infrastructure in Lvov. Uh, we assist uh, to refugees at the border crossing. 
We provided uh, and still providing food and medical supplies for cities under attack. And of course, as you can see now in the picture, uh, the establishment of the field hospital within the territory of Ukraine. This is about uh, 10 miles from the border of Poland. Uh, and the state of Israel, as Jonathan mentioned, is the first state in the world to send uh, such a field hospital to Ukraine. So uh, to put it uh, in the broader picture, uh, Israel is stand together with the Ukrainian people. And uh, now I will uh, uh, move the microphone maybe uh, to them, our uh, heroes in the field. Thank you, Asaf, and thanks to our colleagues at the Foreign Ministry for uh, their, their work uh, during many crises. Uh, we are delighted now to have back, uh, uh, and I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Michal Mekel, um, who is the head of the Israeli delegation to Ukraine. I'll introduce each of our three panelists as I uh, give them their sort of introductory questions, just so, uh, uh, and shorten their, 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 their bios. But I, I do have to say, in addition to being the head of the delegation, um, Dr. Meckel is also the deputy director of Rambam Hospital, uh, where she's the director of endocrine surgery uh, following her studies at Technion and being a fellow at Mass General affiliated with Harvard Medical School. Uh, I guess at Rambam, you've heard, worked through a few uh, sirens in your time. Uh, we were just commenting on uh, the, the, the sort of irony of this, but as head of delegation, um, what, what are your thoughts at the moment? And, and tell us how you're feeling and how you're doing, your team. Uh, hi, sorry for the delay and sorry for the alarm. We, we don't set the, the timing for that. Um, well, we did uh, have in Rambam alarms, you know, during wartime, but we do not have it during routine, whereas uh, other places in Israel do. So for some of us, it is an experience to to feel the life of even some of our uh, families and friends in Israel. Um, so we are the third uh, delegation here. This hospital started to work uh, about five weeks ago. Um, there were two prior delegations. We arrived here um, a week and a half ago. Um, we, we arrived in the hospital. The facility was already, already established. We came here 66 um, medical professionals. We arrived with um, uh, 25 uh, physician and 20 nurses and other specialists uh, and uh, administration and logistics. Um, I can say that from the beginning of the of this uh, hospital, um, we saw uh, over 5,300 patients here, um, and we're supposed to be here until the end of this week. And we look forward to see more and more patients and try to help as many as we can until we we live. Well, thanks for uh, being there and thanks for ex explaining and uh, being prepared for uh, everything that would come with this kind of assignment. Um, I'm going to give a moment for your other co-panelists uh, to introduce themselves and to, for me to introduce them and get some initial comments from them. Uh, and then we'll come back and talk about what it has been to set up a field hospital and what the operation's been like. So we're also joined by Professor Aran Kozer. He, he is the Director of Pediatric, Pediatrics at Asaf Ha Rofeb Medical Center, uh, which is affiliated with Tel Aviv University's Medical School. And uh, he's also a, a past director of the Israeli Association of Toxicology. Um, uh, Aran, I know uh, that you had to get special permission to go on this mission do um, uh, you want to talk about that and, and uh, uh, what it's like for you now operating and uh, working directly with children who are in a war? Uh, thank you, uh, Wayne. So <clears throat> when my hospital director approached me and asked me if I would like to join the delegation, my first response was, yes, I want. But I knew that I have to get permission. Uh, for my wife 
and uh, she approved. So uh, that was easy. I also had to get an approval from my co-workers because uh, my staff uh, are mainly uh, women, mothers, who uh, usually during the Passover takes their family for vacation. Most, many, many of them are religious and enjoy the Cholam you know, uh, to uh, go traveling in Israel. So they had to take my uh, shifts in the emergency department and I had to get their approval and they also approved it uh, very easily. So I was lucky to, to have the opportunity to join this delegation, which I feel is very important. You know, I, just one more word, I grew up in a kibbutz in northern Israel, which was uh, during uh, uh, the uh, late 60s uh, being attacked almost on a weekly base. So I can understand what these children that are in, in um, uh, war zones feel. And I wanted to be here for them. Well, one of the unique aspects of this delegation, ha having heard from the foreign ministry and understanding that this is a you know a government impairment. The the state of Israel and are 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 present you, as we're hearing and and on. We'll hear more. Each of the individuals here are volunteers, and they and their families uh, have made the decision that that this is a priority um, at this time. And it, it it's really quite a, a a testament both to the state of Israel and to the people of Israel uh, about. Uh, their presence and and I, I I was so moved by meeting meeting you in advance of this about your own personal motivations for uh, your involvement in this uh, uh, delegation. So let me uh, turn now to Professor Eldad Katsora. He's the director of the Gertner Institute of Epidemiology and Health Policy at Sheba Medical Center, which is also affiliated with Tel Aviv University. He's the deputy head of the um, humanitarian delegation to Ukraine. And uh, in, indeed, when I think about this panel and your credentials, I mean, you've got uh, world-class physicians that are operating in a tent, in a field hospital, uh, with a great deal of uncertainty around it. Uh, there was a lot of noise for, earlier from the generators and from just some ambient noise in the background. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you could share with us, Professor Katsura, what your experience has been like as on, on, on this delegation and, and what kind of impact you think you're having on the local community? Okay, so first of all, we are all proud to be here. And I think that uh, the Ukrainian people will remember us for many years. And and as Jewish, we are obligated to help the Ukrainian people in, in their uh, worst time. And uh, basically, I'm OBGYN, and uh, we think a lot of uh, things during the, the last 10 days. I think what is uh, unique here that we are, a, it's a multidisciplinary team. First of all, we are coming from all the, the health organization in Israel, say, all the HMOs, all the hospitals. We are a physician, nurses, other health professionals that came from everywhere in Israel. And within 24 hours, we became uh, one group that uh, were able to operate this hospital. and. Very soon, we, uh, we uh, uh, approved and the abilities and gave treatment to all kinds of uh, medical problems, including pediatrics, OBGYN, etc. So this is very unique. Uh, we saw very unique cases. For example, uh, uh, Dr. Kotzer will uh, uh, tell you about the child that we transferred to Shiba Medical Center from uh, Kiev, and also we sent uh, some uh, patient to the big cities around us to uh, 
uh, other treatments, and we also made almost 40 operations uh, within the last months in this in the in this uh, village. So we are doing a lot of things, and I think that uh, the people of this uh, town, village, and this area, and West Ukraine and all Ukraine will remember uh, the state of Israel for many years. Well, again, the, the messages coming through from our audience are, are, are of pride, are of, of concern, and uh, a recognition that from Israel's very difficult security situation, being able to share not merely goodwill and good thoughts, which are terrific, but actual expertise and actual services on the ground is really remarkable. And uh, uh, so again, I, I, I'm just struck with the need to uh, share that, that tremendous outpouring of, of appreciation and pride, frankly, uh, uh, that we're hearing from, from people around the world. Dr. Meckel, I know we got uh, sort of a side track to um, make our introductions. Uh, we definitely have some questions uh, already coming in about, uh, you know, the, 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 the sheer size of your team and the, uh, 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 the layout of the hospital, which I know we have a video which we'll show in a moment, but perhaps you could tee that up a little bit with just a little bit of an explanation of what it, what, what, um, and I know there have been rotations, so if you can explain a little bit the, the history of this field hospital and the actual mission that, that uh, uh, you set out to attain. Um, yeah, so the hospital was established and started to work on March 22nd. Um, first delegation arrived here just a couple of days before and uh, with um, between the 65 to 70 medical personnel. The, the hospital is, uh, was established in the area of a school. Uh, the entire hospital is been built in tents in the playground of the school and everything is being done here. Um, the patients have like a flow where they go in, we have an emergency room, we have a triage, we have uh, outpatient clinics with um, several specialties like uh, rheumatologists and internists, um, orthopedics and general surgeon and ENT and ophthalmology. We have pediatrics and OBGYN. We really give service to all, uh, any aspects you would think of. And in addition, we use telemedicine if for certain specialties we do not have with us, um, such as, uh, for example, dermatology. Um, so we use telemedicine. We also have an admitting ward, uh, which is uh, built for 30 patients. Uh, that could be for adults, as well as a pediatric ward. Uh, we operate, we do here minor procedures uh, but when we have big procedures that would need full anesthesia, we do it in the local hospital just here nearby where we uh, collaborate with them. Um, Professor Catoza mentioned that, you know, that people will remember us here. I think that in addition to, to, to treat the patients here, the local patients, the, the people from around and refugees, we also think that part of our mission is to try to give as much as we can to the medical people here in terms of training uh, training and guidance and they appreciate it very much well what you're describing is is um uh you do so in such a professional manner and and uh the the fact that israel has experience in setting up and going into uh, uh theaters of war um is, is, is uh, uh, something that is well known, but seeing how it is operating and who it is serving in this context is really quite a, um, it's a miracle happening before our eyes. So let, let's uh, queue up that, the, the video that'll show people some of the operation of what you're doing uh, day to day. And, um, and then we'll hear actually about some of the patients that you've already encountered. Um, and some of the stories that 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 uh, are emerging uh, between the Ukrainian and, and Israeli people. Hello. 
Hello, my name is Dr. Ram Sagi. I am the head of the Israeli delegation to Ukraine. Uh, I want to show you our field hospital, the Israeli field hospital in Ukraine, which uh, started work at the 22 of March, uh, treated until now more than 2,100 patients. So let's start and see our hospital. This is the patients which are waiting that we will enter them inside the hospital. The first uh, thing that they will meet is a triage. Here we have a physician, we have nurses that triage them, sort them uh, regarding their condition. If they need to go to the emergency department, to the outpatient clinic, maybe to the pediatric division. So let's go inside the outpatient clinics we can meet family physicians, nurses, and some of our consultants, like ENT physician, uh, ophthalmology, uh, orthopedics, neurology, geriatrics, radiology. We have several consultants here. Due to the fact that the weather here is cold and sometimes rainy, you can see here that patients get blankets, hot things to warm them. And uh, you can see that there is also a big waiting area that they can wait here uh, in comf comfortable conditions until they get the medical treatment. The field hospital has also auxiliary services. One of them is here the radi radiology. And as you can see, we have also the laboratory and also pharmacy. Another effort which you are doing here in the hospital is the training. Training for physicians, for nurses, in many other many professions. ATLS, ACLS, groups, or also personal trainers. And here in this tent, we have uh, the options of advanced technologies of Shiba Beyond, which have advanced technologies in order to diagnose patients, but then also to treat the patients. Here we have the obstetric and gynecology section. We treat uh, women uh, which uh, are pregnant for follow-up and also for a variety of uh, problems. We also have the pediatric kingdom. The pediatric kingdom uh, consists of two compounds, the pediatric emergency department and also a pediatric ward for pediatric patients. We treat them not only with uh, medical treatment, but also with complementary treatment, including some toys, some bears, some uh, lollipops. Right now we're inside the school. Here we have several words, words for children, Words for female, words for males. Here they get the treatment, hospitalized, and afterwards they will discharge to the community or to other facilities. The last effort, last but not least, is the mental health effort. And uh, we have a psychiatrist and also psychologist which give mental health assistance for people that suffer from post trauma. We give this assistance here in the field hospital, but also in a school nearby, which refugees stay there and uh, get the treatment there. For summary, we are very proud to be here, to give medical assistance, medical treatment to the people who need it. Uh, very proud to reach our hand those who need it, and uh, we do it with a uh, smile and uh, with a lot of uh, love and passion. You know, one of... I have two favorites from that video. Uh, uh, one is just that last shot where you actually see 
the distinctions of what you would normally find in a hospital, let's say a physical hospital, a hospital uh, that doesn't have to have uh, uh, alarm sirens going off during their operation, but you can actually see how even though it's temporary, even though it's in a field that, that there are certain areas designated and we could see all the uh, supplies and equipment, it's not just merely saying this is radiology, this is uh, pediatrics. And the second piece is, is pediatrics, seeing children both in the school and in your facility uh, who during this very traumatic period um, are, are, are being aided by and supported by uh, uh, trained physicians. And that, that is uh, somewhat um, um, gratifying to know that there is that, that extra uh, presence there. So um, Professor Kozer, could you could per perhaps share one or two of the stories of some of the children? What are you seeing? How are, are they reacting? And what are some of the kind of uh, 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 cases that have made a big impression on you? Okay, um, many of the children we see here um, are suffering from uh, uh, minor illnesses, you know, the uh, regular pediatric problems of coughing, uh, fever, diarrhea, etc. I would like to share with the audience a special case of a girl that we treated here. Uh, her name uh, is Dasha. She was uh, injured in a bombing two weeks prior to her arrival to our hospital. And actually, I got a call from uh, the pediatrician that was here uh, before me, and he told me, you know, there is a girl that coming to the hospital just to see her, see if she is okay, and if she is stable, uh, transfer, uh, she will join our flight to Israel. Uh, but uh, Dasha arrived after the flight already uh, went to Israel and she needed a medical assistant. So she actually spent here five days. She had uh, severe injuries in both legs and uh, once she came here she was frightened. She, she was uh, in pain um, and she arrived at about uh, I think 11 p.m. at night with her mother, with an ambulance, to a place she never saw before. And at, at the moment she came, uh, you know, three or four physicians set, <coughs> stand around her uh, with uh, four nurses and uh, all the staff started taking care of her. And um, slowly, slowly, uh, during her stay here, she became much more... Uh, um, less frightened, uh, more less in pain, more ha happier, and she got uh, the medical treatment she needed here. We couldn't, of course, give her the, uh, the uh, operate her here. She needed a more advanced treatment, and uh, but she also got you know the physiotherapist help her to sit and then sit on a wheelchair and then go out to the chair. And uh, we have a mental health a pediatric nurse that uh, connected her with her very nicely and helped her to, to absorb the situation. So I think the, she left our facility in much better state. I don't know if you have the video of her living there. We do, we do. Thank you for sharing that um, by way of introduction and for helping arrange uh, for, uh, we'll, we'll queue up the video now and let everyone uh, uh, see her. So Dasha is actually now in Tel Shomer and she already went through uh, one operation and uh, waiting for rehabilitation. Uh, and which looking we, great. Yeah, and she looks great and uh, happy. Well, if, if I have one more minute, I Please. will. Uh, yeah. 
share another case which is still evolving, so I'm not sure how it will end up. It's a girl that came here for just to get a second opinion because she's uh, not growing well. It's a five-year-old girl that uh, already went through several uh, investigations. And you are, during our routine checkup, uh, we noticed that you have a significant heart murmur. We have an adult cardiologist here that performed a partial echo, which was, uh, of course, uh, pathologic. And there is uh, an organization in Israel, um, well, uh, I think it's an international organization called Save a Child's Heart. And actually this organization, uh, we con connected this girl with this organization and we, they will probably will be, will be able to uh, fly her to Israel for surgery. So wow. this is still evolving, so I don't know exactly how it will end up, but we are working on it. Well, it, it, it's not, I guess, surprising that given Israel's expertise in lots of different areas of, of the body uh, medically, that you're going to come across uh, patients who are going to have uh, special needs that, that uh, uh, perhaps only can actually be serviced in Israel. Thanks, soon we'll... we'll We'll continue to hope and pray for her that 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 does become a possi possibility, Professor Katorza. I you know I'm we have several questions already. I'm going to start moving into some of the questions, uh, you know, and, and several relate to just the fact that you're doing this mission during COVID, and as physicians, you're an epidemiologist. You're well. Uh, versed in what the best things hospitals need to be doing and practitioners. What, what have you encountered working in this particular uh, uh, setting uh, to protect yourselves? Uh, and, um, and have you seen anything that's, that's different, you know, that you wouldn't see in Israel uh, by virtue of the fact that you're, you're operating in this, this, this field hospital uh, in Ukraine now? Uh, first of all, we are uh, taking care and think very seriously about this uh, situation of uh, treating people that we don't know their COVID status. Uh, first, to protect ourselves and uh, to keep our ability to work. For example, if uh, all of our delegation will be positive and ill for COVID, so we cannot accomplish our mission. So we sent her to uh, treat people and we need to be able to be healthy and to be able to uh, complete our mission. So our state of mind was that uh, we protect ourselves as much as we can and we wear, we wear masks everywhere, including uh, uh, during our mission and we give all the patient when they interest to the hospital mask and uh, during the time we found that three of our uh, staff were uh, positive to COVID and um, we uh, succeeded to stop this uh, uh, explosion of uh, uh, the COVID in our team and right now uh, they came back to work and everything is okay so we took it into concern and uh, we change our state of mind. Usually when somebody is positive, uh, we check everybody, etc. But uh, we, we knew that uh, we should be able to complete our mission and to change the paradigm, how we work in, in this set of hospital, that it's not a irregular uh, hospital, and uh, I am happy to say that we succeeded and right now we don't have uh, positive uh, staff and we are doing all, all the mission that we need to do and, and that's very good because in the first delegation almost half of them uh, return uh, positive and they had uh, some problems to maintain their abilities to work during uh, this situation but we uh, we succeeded and it, that's thanks to the staff that were uh, very old very strictly to the orders and then uh, we're happy about that 
Uh, Dr. Mecco, uh, I know you speak very good English and even better Hebrew probably, uh, but I understand that those are not the primary languages of uh, communication with your patients. So can you tell us, uh, we have numerous questions from people who are asking, what is the language that you're speaking in? Um, how are you dealing with that? And, and uh, a, a specific question from Mindy about your collaboration with other Ukrainian health professionals and hospitals during this mission. Okay, so I would say that about 70% of, of the people on our delegation speak either Russian or Ukrainian. So those are two different languages. And those that speak Russian, they understand more or less Ukrainian. Uh, so for those who speak either Russian or Ukrainian, it's, it's okay. And because we have so many Ukrainian Russian speaking uh, personnel, we, we, we do manage. We also have translator, professional translator, usually health professionals from Ukraine uh, that come here to do translations. And of course we use one the other so usually i would say with the pediatrics so uh professor Kotel that doesn't speak the language has a, has a physician with him that does speak the language um and a nurse that does maybe and a nurse that doesn't so so we manage um regarding our collaboration with the other with the health uh, system here so we got very very good uh, cooperation with the mayor of this town and with the there is a local hospital here and also with the hospital director uh, as I mentioned we, we do our uh, large cases uh, operations in the local hospital where we bring our um, the equipment that we brought with us we bring it to the hospital and uh, we operate there together with the people there, again, in order to give them some training, some guidance, and also for the continuity of care for the people who would stay here uh, once we uh, go back to Israel. Uh, so we have a very, very good um, collaboration with them. And actually, we hope that this is something we would maintain, because I think uh, both sides can, um, can earn from that. Uh, Professor Katorza, um, uh, we had a question about where the pa where the patients are coming from. Are they local? Are they refugees? Are they a mix? Are they coming from fleeing from different war uh, theaters? Uh, you know, where or are they more local and regional based? Uh, first of all, it's hard to know exactly where they come from. Uh, we estimate that around 75%, 80% of the people are uh, local from this region, and around 20% are uh, refugees from a uh, far area around Lviv or maybe uh, western to Lviv. And in this delegation, we made a lot of efforts to be able to bring more refugees, and I'm happy to say that we succeeded. And uh, in the last days, uh, there were almost 100 refugees that uh, came to our hospital uh, from, uh, not, not in this region, from uh, a city south to Lviv. And uh, we spoke about the uh, mayor of this uh, village and also from, with the, uh, a senior journalist and local press and uh, health services. And we are doing a lot of efforts that uh, the people, the refugees, where they stay, we know about our location, our abilities. And we also send our transportation. We, we, we tell them, tell us where to go and we send a driver with a bus or minibus and we bring them here and two days ago early in the morning we had the 50 or 60 refugees that came and it was uh, very dramatic to see them they were hungry children far away with the pregnant woman and you know it's unique because the husband stay in the world and this is uh, 
a problem of uh, young women with the uh, children they they should manage alone without without the husband and they have their uh, local health problem the, the regular problem and also some of them are pregnant and children problems so it was very dramatic and all of us all the staff were very emotionally to this uh, situation and we hope that uh, during the last days that we uh, stay here many more refugees will come and we'll be able to uh, to help them also professor Kozer, i'm i'm um i'm i'm curious what kind of uh, uh observations you have about how the kids in particular are dealing with the trauma of the war. Um, there was a reference to the, I know you have some expertise in the delegation that, that are dealing with trauma and psychological issues. Could you talk about that and, and give us just sort of a little bit of perspective about how kids are seeing you know, this, this whole period that, that they're living through? So we, we all know that children react very um, in, in different ways when they uh, experience trauma. And uh, some of these uh, presentations are psychosomatic, so abdominal pain or cough or tics, etc. And we, we see these problems and sometimes when we can identify them, we can try to help and refer them to the right uh, intervention, you know, the, the, you can't really uh, provide uh, long-term treatment here, but we can offer the parents and the children some directions how to react to these uh, conditions. As I mentioned, we have a, a, a mental health nurse Specific, uh, uh, specializing in pediatric, she worked in a pediatric uh, psychiatric ward, and she do a tremendous work with these kids, uh, sitting with them, playing with them, and uh, while playing, uh, helping them to uh, um, overcome those problems. Also, uh, um, there is a kit of so-called games that uh, was developed in order to help the children uh, open up and speak about their problems and they provide them this kit with some instructions how to use it and um, we don't still of course don't know how it works uh, whether it helps but we feel it might be uh, useful for them. Uh, Dr. Meckel, we we um, we saw in the video early on uh, um, uh, a mannequin and some other sort of instructional kind of uh, activities uh, uh, with both kids and adults. Can you talk about that other aspect of the mission that relate to training and taking advantage of your presence there to do some health education in different uh, capacities? Yes, definitely it is part of the mission. So we're gonna live, uh, leave here in a few in a few days, and um, alongside to everything we did for the people here, we do want to to leave something here, and uh, we see that either uh, medical professionals or even um, young teenagers or other health professionals they really need the the knowledge, and we have the knowledge to give them. Um, we had very nice activities. Um, for example, we had one for the people in the school, in this school, where we brought the mothers to talk about home accidents, and we brought the youth to talk about uh, basic life support. We gave uh, a training for, um, for professionals, uh, psychiatric and social workers, in terms of... Um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, sexual, and abuse. sexual abuse for for um, for people maybe also for refugees. Um, so we definitely think this is part of what we can do for them. 
Um, and we'll, we'll try to maintain that even from long distance because some of that you can do using telemedicine and once we have the connections, we are going to try to maintain that part. So uh, we have visitors today from around the world. Some are celebrating uh, the ending of uh, Passover. Some are celebrating Easter and Easter uh, festivities. Some are celebrating the end uh, of this period of, of Ramadan. And I know all of those uh, experiences are, are happening with your team. I wanted to show a short video that, that you were good enough to, to share with us uh, earlier about this particular rotation happened to be here during Passover and Passover Seder. And so you had to be away from your families. So I just want to show, share this with uh, our audience so they get a sense and then I'll ask each of you uh, just for a closing thought before, before we head out. Go ahead. Um. Professor Katorza, I'll begin with you. Just a, 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 a minute on what this means to you personally, being a part of this delegation at this time. Uh, for me, it's a huge right to be here as a human being, as a Jewish, as a physician. And, you know, when, as you said at the beginning, Israel is the only nation that built an hospital for uh, humanitarian reasons in the land of uh, Ukraine. And for me, it means a lot. It, it's a big say, and uh, I think it will remain a, a legacy of what we did here to support to Ukrainian people uh, during the very uh, tough days. And uh, everyone here that came for Passover sacrificed a lot in their personal life. You know, they left their families, their child. It's a holiday. And they left uh, everything and came here to work from morning to night, seven days per week, and to give uh, the, the much they can give. And uh, I think that's a, a huge thing that we are doing here. Professor Kozer, I know uh, the Israeli delegation is made up people of, of many different uh, faiths. Have people been able to, uh, uh, in some way, take uh, their own personal observance into account as well? I, I, I join Professor Katoza in what he says. I think for me, it's a privilege to be here. I, I don't think I sacrifice. I, I, I feel that I, I, my feeling is that I was uh, um, I was privileged to be here and to so, to show my support and uh, my empathy to the people of Ukraine and the, just the kids that I see. It's 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 what the, the least I can do. Doctor Meckel, um, you said you're you're heading back uh, in a couple of days with the conclusion of the. Uh, the mission, could you just uh, uh, share what this has meant for you and what the legacy you think of, of serving in the name of, uh, we never got to point this out at the beginning, but this field hospital is named for a certain uh, Ukrainian born Israeli leader that is iconic for many of us. So maybe you could uh, 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 close this out in, in, in her image. Yeah, so the, this mission is called After Golda Meir, uh, which, is, which was born in Ukraine, and she established uh, Mashav in the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Um, I think I, I do want to relate to the video. I think you saw there in the video the Seder, which was only two days after we arrived. And you see, we, we, we look like a family celebrating the Seder. And actually, none of us knew one another just uh, two days before. And here we are all together. And there is one, one goal that connects us all and is 
everyone's here to help, to help the other, to help the Ukrainian people. And I think this is what being an Israeli means. And I'm very proud to be an Israeli, and I'm very proud to be here. Um, this is the, the, the little that we could, can do. Hopefully the war will end soon. Well, you've done more than a little, and you've really lifted up uh, uh, for, for us today uh, a remarkable instinct, I would say, of the Israeli people. Uh, you are serving humanity. That is your calling as a profession, but it's also a calling of, of the Israeli people to help where they can and, and to do so in unique ways and really quickly uh, to get into not be on the ground, to be there for this uh, uh, incredibly global challenge. Um, it's really a testament to the Israeli people, the Israeli government, and to you as individuals. So thank you to you. Thank you to your families. We invite all of our audience uh, uh, to come back. We'll be back again this Wednesday, uh, the 27th. It, we have a program in honor of Yom HaShoah that uh, is about the heroes of Salonika with actual filmmakers and testimony from the Jewish community of Salonika in Greece. It will be a very powerful presentation, I promise you. And we, we wish that the legacy of the Holocaust experienced by the Jewish people is something that allows others to understand the importance for humanity and peace. So please have a safe week, everyone. Our prayers are with all our, our, our friends and uh, people of goodwill in Ukraine, in, in Russia, and uh, we are, are hoping for, praying for, and continuing uh, to take action to advance peace in this time. Leitro, be safe.